So for us to be on the same page, uh, discussing my topic, I'll just briefly mention uh, these two techniques, the radio interferometry and the very long baseline interferometry technique. I'll not get into the details, but I'll just discuss how we apply this technique so that we get to understand what I'm talking about in the next slide. So um, in radio astronomy, you can carry out observation uh, either using a single dish or you can uh, carry out observation using uh, two or more telescopes uh, simultaneously observing the same source in sky at the same time. So when you have, when you combine one or more than two telescopes, we form what we call a radio telescope array. And uh, for example, in this case, I've shown a single dish here. This is the Lovell telescope at the Jodre Bank uh, Observatory. And then we have examples of um, radio telescope arrays. Uh, we have the Kaljansky very large array in the US, which is composed of uh, 28 uh, dishes with a maximum baseline of 36 kilometers. And then we have the email in here, which is uh, the enhanced multi-element uh, radio leaked interferometry network in the UK, composed of seven uh, telescopes that are uh, distributed across the UK with a maximum baseline of 220 kilometers. When I talk about the maximum baseline, that is the uh, maximum distance between any two uh, telescopes in a given array. So another aspect, a uh, very important aspect in radio astronomy is the angular resolution of a radio telescope. And uh, the angular resolution is the ability of a radio telescope to distinguish uh, twin finer details of sources or objects in the sky. And this usually depends on the wavelength of the observation and the dish diameter uh, in the case of an array, uh, the maximum baseline. So for example, for a single dish, uh, this is the formula for the angular resolution. And for an array, this is the uh, formula for the angular resolution, which is given by the uh, wavelength divided by the baseline. So you applying this um, radio interferometry technique, we see that um, the baseline, the maximum baseline of uh, an array is equivalent to the, uh, to the diameter of a single dish. So for example, here, um, yeah, you see the, for example, at an, on the, on the, at an observation of, uh, at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz, uh, this is the angular resolution using a single dish. It is 11.83 arc minutes. You bring in a, a couple of telescopes with a maximum baseline of 36 kilometers and you improve this angular resolution at this frequency to about uh, one, one arc, one arc second. Similarly, when you add in the emailing uh, due to this uh, long um, baseline, again, you greatly improve the angular resolution from a single uh, dish um, resolution of 11.81 arc minute all the way to uh, 0 0.2 arc second. So the radio interferometry technique enables us to achieve very high angular resolutions without necessarily having to construct a very uh, huge uh, telescope of say 220 kilometers because we know that is a physically impossible. So that is the importance of the uh, radio interferometry technique. Some more examples of uh, radio interferometers across the world. We have the ALMA. This is the uh, Atacama large millimeter array in uh, Chile, the Atacama Desert. We have the ATCA in Australia. We have Alpha, which is uh, distributed across Europe with the core stations in uh, Netherlands. We have the West Bank, which is composed of 13 uh, telescopes. And then we have the GMRT in India, which is composed of 30 45 meter dishes in India. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard about the square kilometer array, which is uh, going to be like the next uh, big uh, scientific project in the Southern Hemisphere. So we'll have SKA uh, one in um, Australia, and then we have a two in uh, the Karoo in South Africa. And this is the uh, SKA headquarters at the Jore Bank Observatory. And that's this just showing the amount of data that will be produced from this uh, scientific endeavors. And on this uh, slide, I'm just trying not to say that, you know, get over science, get over particle physics, radio astronomy is the next big thing. Again, so, uh, we move from uh, an array of a few um, hundred kilometers to an array of thousands of kilometers. 
that forms the very long baseline interferometry. So um, again, I'll not get into details of this uh, VLBI technique, but uh, generally um, time delay, that is the difference in arrival time between station one and station two. These are two antennas on the R surface. There's an observed uh, difference in arrival time. Say for example, we have this uh, source that is billions of light years away emitting light. So we have light traveling from this source all the way to antenna one, then light traveling from this source all the way to antenna two. And clearly you can see that there's a, an observable difference in the arrival, uh, in time arrival. So, and uh, the time delay or the difference in time arrival is given by this formula. And uh, yeah, so eventually we combine this data and correlate the data to correct for things like a geometric effect, atmospheric effect, time delays, phase delays, and instrumental effect, because you're using uh, several dishes uh, distributed all over the world. So we have to consider all these factors in your data correlation. And like I, I previously said, um, when you talk about interferometry, the maximum baseline of an array is equivalent to um, the diameter of a single dish. Uh, so VLBA offers us uh, maximum baselines of more than 10,000 kilometers, thereby giving us a very high angular resolution, like I'll show you in the next few slides. So some of the applications of uh, VLBI in astronomy is used for measuring uh, photometric magnitudes, that is, for example, flux densities of sources. It is used in the determination of very precise coordinates, uh, that is astrometric VLBI. And this is important in the maintenance of the International uh, well, Celestial Reference Frame, ICRF. And then VLBI is also used in the measurements of uh, coordinates on the Earth's surface, the Earth's orientation and rotation in space. This is geodetic VLBI. And again, this is important in uh, maintaining the international terrestrial reference frame, ITRF. And just to highlight that uh, ICRF and ITRF are very important in, uh, in terms of navigation, which is used in the maintenance of uh, the GPS, ETC. VLBI is also used in uh, studies, uh, relativistic studies and cosmological models of the universe. So this map here shows the uh, global distribution of the global uh, VLBI networks. For example, we have the EVN. This is the European Very Long Baseline Interferometry Network, as shown here. We have uh, telescopes distributed across Europe and one in Africa. And then again, we have the Very Long Baseline Array in the US. Uh, yeah, we have about uh, 10 uh, telescopes distributed across the United States. So just, and then again, we have the long baseline array in Australia. And as you can clearly see, and then we have a few in uh, Asia, but clearly we only have one um, VLB station in Africa. This is the Hartley Stoke. Uh, uh, this is a 25 meter dish at the Hartley Stoke Radio Astronomy Observatory in South Africa, which provides these long baselines to the EVN, the VLBA, and the LBA. Like I said, the EVN has a bus, uh, maximum baseline of about uh, 10,000 kilometers, and you can see at a frequency of uh, about 1.4, you can see provide very high angular resolutions, and similarly with the VLBA. So, um, uh, this is the work that I did for my uh, master's thesis, whereby we just try to look at the impact that a possible um, group of antennas uh, on the African continent could have on global VLBI network. Like I've just shown on this map, you can see uh, clearly that if you have any uh, telescopes across Africa, it'd be very useful in these uh, global arrays. So we have... Uh, SKEA partner member countries in Africa, which is led by South Africa. We have Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, Madagascar, and Mauritius. And for the purposes of these uh, studies, we opted to add other few African countries, which form the uh, AVN2. And AVN, this is the African VLBI network. So we have Ethiopia, Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, and Senegal. And just to highlight that we have uh, the proposed SKEA will be built in South Africa and then 
we want to provide uh, VLDI capability to these uh, uh, to the core stations in South Africa. So there's a proposal to uh, convert some uh, satellite dishes that were formerly used for communication uh, across the African continent to uh, for um, radio astronomy purposes, so that they provide um, VLDI to the SKE. So we have uh, proposed dishes in uh, conversion of dishes in uh, Zambia. Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, and Ghana. So again, looking at the astronomy activities across the African continent, uh, we have the HESS in Namibia. We have uh, the Ontoto Observatory in Ethiopia. We have uh, Katami Ast Astronomical Observatory in Egypt, Algeria and Morocco, and uh, Salt, Mialik, Nyakat, and Hatoro in uh, South Africa. And just to highlight that, um, so in my case, I'm dealing with the radio astronomy, uh, but just to highlight that all these uh, on the Northern part, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, all uh, optical astronomy, and uh, we only have radio astronomy in South Africa. So this is uh, uh, one of the uh, SKA precursor telescopes in South Africa. It's called the MIAKAT, that is the Karo Array Telescope in Karo, Northern Cape, South Africa. So it will be an array of 64 antennas with a maximum baseline of eight kilometers and a very high dynamical angular resolution from uh, one arc second all the way to one arc minute at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz, a very high sensitive observations of about one microjansky per beam, and then a very uh, large field of view of more than 20 degrees squared. So the justification for this study is that uh, the African continent is now co connected to the fiber optic, and therefore uh, these are satellite dishes that were formerly used for communication are now redundant. And therefore, instead of these dishes going into waste, they can uh, be converted for astronomical purposes, which is uh, cheaper and easier since we know that building a radio telescope from scratch is a very expensive affair. In turn, these facilities can be used as training and research centers for science, engineering, technology in these countries. And also these points can be used for, uh, they can become points of reference for mapping and navigation in these countries. So for example, you have the Longono station here in Kenya, the Madagascar site, the, uh, the dish in Kutunse, this is Ghana and Mauritius. So, so our objective was to evaluate the impact that uh, a possible array of uh, uh, VLBI antennas on Africa could have on global uh, VLBI networks in terms of astronomy, geodesy, and astrometry. So we investigated the impact of the AVN on geodetic products. This is uh, through simulated earth orientation parameters. We also determined the accuracy of source position in the Southern hemisphere and also created UV uh, coverage plots for the uh, LBA in the Southern Hemisphere and the EVN in the Northern Hemisphere. So some of our results, I'll not dwell on this too much. So uh, we looked at the UV coverage of the EVN at a declination of 20. So you can see that uh, uh, at short baselines, the UV coverage is perfect for the EVN. And then we have uh, nothing on the medium baseline. But the long baseline has some sort of uh, UV coverage that is provided by the uh, radio telescope in South Africa. So this is the observation declination of 20 degrees with the AVN alone. Then you bring in the AVN antennas and you can clearly see that uh, the AVN will greatly improve the UV coverage for the EVN by providing uh, coverage along the medium to long baseline. Similarly, bringing the entire AVN antennas, you can see that it greatly improve the UV coverage for any observations with the EVN at this declination. So uh, the bottom panel here just shows when you bring in specific antenna. So for example, when you add uh, a Kenyan antenna to this observation, you see that you sort of somehow provide UV coverage on the median baseline. Similarly, when you add in the Ghanaian telescope and Ethiopia telescope, you see have almost the same effect. This is because uh, Kenya, Ghana, Ethiopia uh, somehow lie on the same declination. So that is for the Northern Hemisphere. And then here now we have for the Southern Hemisphere where we have the long baseline array in uh, Australia. So this is the UV coverage of the LBA at a declination of minus 90. So you can see uh, 
UV coverage is just on a short baseline. Then you add in the AVN one antennas to this observation, and you can see that you greatly improve the UV coverage uh, from the medium uh, baselines all the way to the long baselines. Similarly, when you bring in the uh, entire AVN array, you can see that we fully uh, cover the uh, UV, we provide sufficient UV coverage at an observation at a declination of minus 90 degrees. Um, yeah, and then again, so for example, we take a telescope in Mauritius and add it to this observation. You can see that a telescope in Mauritius will greatly impact the VLB observation. So this is the VLB observation, adding the Kenyan antenna at a declination of minus 90. Kenya will definitely have no effect because it's up higher. Uh, but then you bring in Kenya at a declination of minus 70, and you see that you're able to improve the UV coverage along the long baseline. Again, looking at uh, geodetic products, um, I'll not dwell too much on this, but uh, we have this session here, the R1675. It's a real session that was carried out using the uh, EVN antennas to uh, survey or estimate the earth orientation parameter. That is the polar motion, the earth's rotation, and the earth mutation x and y coordinates. So we have the real uh, session here, and these are the errors on the polar motion, uh, earth rotation, and mutation. So we simulated this session. These are the errors that we got from our simulation. And then we added the AVN antennas to this session, and you can uh, see the impact that the uh, AVN antennas will have on this session. We almost have the errors in the other orientation parameters. For example, in the polar motion um, X coordinate, you see you almost have the errors from 27 all the way to 18. Similarly, you can see from 51 all the way to 24. So um, adding AVN antennas to a, a geodetic VLB observation with the EVN would greatly improve the, the measurements of the other orientation parameters. Uh, the second, uh, the third uh, objective was to calculate or to est estimate source position. So we did this uh, looking at the, um, in looking, uh, in the southern hemisphere. So for example, we have this session here, it's the CRD, CRDS. This is the celestial reference frame for the deep south. And it's just observed with, using the LDA because it's for the southern hemisphere only. So these are the um, mean average errors in uh, array, mean average error in the declination. So these are the values you get when you have the C CRDS only. Uh, but then you add the AVN1 antennas and you can see that you greatly improve on the measurements of the array from 0 0.345 all the way to 0 0.135. And similarly, when you look at declination from 0 0.57 all the way to 0 0.242. So clearly adding the AVN1 antennas to uh, a session with the LB will greatly improve uh, estimates on the source position. So conclusion is that the AVN will greatly impact global VLB networks, we improve the UV coverage for the EVN in the Northern Hemisphere and the LB in the Southern Hemisphere, reduce the errors in uh, other orientation parameter measurements and increase the accuracy of source position estimates. And specific antennas such as Senegal and Kenya will greatly improve the EVN. And as again as shown, an antenna in Mauritius will significantly add to the LB network. So I don't know if there are any questions up to that point. All right, so I'll get into more serious stuff for what I'm uh, currently working on. So this is one of uh, my topics in my research work. Uh, it's the VLB observations of a faint Microzansky extragalactic radio sources. And when I talk about extragalactic radio sources, these are sources outside our Milky Way galaxy. This is at a redshift of greater than zero. So, and then we apply a technique called the wide field VLBA observation using the VLBA and EVN to observe one of the uh, fields. It's called the Gusnov field at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. And this is my supervisory team. Uh, uh, we have some few guys from uh, University of Pretoria, that is Jack and Roger. 
So let's give you an outline, the background of uh, this topic, why VLBI, discuss the white field VLBI technique and present some results from uh, this survey with the EVN and VLBA, and give you some conclusions for the future and SKA VLBI. So, sorry. One of the main goals in astrophysics is study the history of star formation and galaxy evolution across cosmic time. And uh, yeah, looking at these two plots here, the first plot shows the uh, star formation rate as a function of redshift or time. And the second plot here shows the AGN activity, that is the active galactic nuclear activity as a function of uh, redshift or time. And AGN, presence of AGN is just an indicator of uh, black hole accretion. Therefore, these two plots, the first plot, you can clearly see that the uh, star formation rate uh, tends to pick from a uh, redshift of about two, one all the way to a redshift of two. Similarly, AGN activity tends to pick from a redshift of one all the way to a redshift of two. So there's a clear coevolution between these two uh, processes. And just to highlight that, considering uh, uh, these um, galaxies are very far away, at uh, these high redshifts, it's very difficult to distinguish between these two processes. And that's why we need uh, very high angular resolution observations. And like I've been talking about this talk, that's why we really need uh, the VLBI technique, which uh, in turn gives us very high angular uh, resolution scales, uh, which in turn able, enables us to distinguish between these two processes. So this, with that background, it forms the or rather it forms the background for this talk that we, we want to distinguish these two processes that these are very high redshift. And we do this by applying the radio interferometry and the very long baseline interferometry, interferometric technique. So um, when we observe these uh, faint extragalactic uh, uh, radio sources, uh, there's an expected upsurge of uh, sources at sub Milijansky levels. And what do I mean with that? So looking at this plot, it shows the number source count density as a function of uh, flux density. So above a flux density of one Milijansky, the evolution of this, curve, of this curve is what is expected. This is normal, but uh, uh, anything um, below uh, one Milijansky, there's an expected upturn on this curve and uh, further studying this region, resolving all these uh, radio source populations, that is resolving the population below the uh, flux density of one Milijansky. See that the uh, region of the population is mainly composed of star forming regions and uh, uh, active galactic nuclei. So I'm just, like I said in the previous slide, this uh, faint radio sources or these faint sources are heavily obscured in the X-ray infrared and optical uh, due to dust extinction. However, we know that uh, the radio band does not suffer from dust extinction and therefore it offers biostressor for uh, star formation and agent activity in these uh, distant galaxies. We further bring in interferometric radio continent surveys, which in turn offer high angular resolution and high sensitivity, which in turn which in turn detects accretion emission from AGN and thereby giving us the ability or capability to distinguish between uh, star formation and AGN activity in these distant galaxies. So if further bring in VLBI and VLBI is uh, sensitive to very high brightness temperatures of more than 100,000 Kelvin. And at these distant galaxies, we just a clear indicator of the presence of AGN. Therefore applying uh, rather using uh, radio interferometry and VLBI, we uh, some sort of somehow have an opportunity to distinguish between star formation and agent activity at this um, high ratio. So why VLBI? Like I've been saying, so we have, uh, I've shown you the VLA and then the Meerkat, which offers AXEC and uh, uh, scale res angular resolutions, which are in turn insufficient to specially resolve uh, AGN from star formation in these distant galaxies. And again, I mentioned the Emalin, which gives a sub second angular resolution scales, and thereby it's only partially, uh, it's only able to partially resolve these galaxies. Uh, however, VLB provides ultra high milliac second angular resolution. So uh, 
This plot here shows the various radio continuum surveys that are uh, currently ongoing or planned or already published. So for example, we have here uh, SKA uh, made observation, I'm sorry. So this shows the angular resolution for various uh, radio continuum surveys. So we have the planned SKA one, and then we have uh, the mighty survey with Meerkat and uh, the evolutionary map of the universe survey with SCAP. And just to mention that these two are precursors to the SKA. And then we have published, you have Cosmos. And then we have image here. And this is the uh, Emalin's uh, uh, evolutionary, whatever, sorry. So this is, if you read my, sorry, this is the Emalin Galaxy Evolution Survey. And if you read my abstract, this project forms the basis for my uh, PhD thesis. We are just trying to disentangle these two processes at uh, these high red sheets um, using observations carried out by the Emalin telescope and the VLA. So you can see the angular resolutions for these observations or instrument. And uh, this is the spatial resolution for this uh, surveys or these instruments at uh, a redshift of 1.25. And again, here you see the observations with the EVN and VLBA, which forms the basis of this work. You can see that we have very high angular resolution scales. Thereby, therefore, VLBA provides a powerful extinction tree to, to look for this elusive AGN and to specially resolve AGN from star formation. So um, apart from uh, AGN uh, probes, we have other, uh, pro other uses of VLBI in radio astronomy. It's used for probing gravitational lenses and study of dark matter, uh, studying tidal disruption events. For example, um, in a case where uh, a star was torn apart uh, by uh, nearby supermassive black hole. Again, studying feeding monsters is the studying of materials falling or ejected from or falling into black holes. And again, this very famous uh, first image of a black hole uh, provided by Event Horizon Telescope Consortium. So this is the first image of, uh, this is the first ever image of a black hole, which was uh, made possible by the application of the VLBI technique. So um, we discussed the white field VLBI technique. So historically, uh, the VLBI has been limited by a small field of view. That is, we've only been able to uh, image the few central arc minutes or arc seconds of uh, observation. However, recent development in software correlators, widening bandwidths in observation, uh, development in computers, have enabled the correlation of uh, VLBI data at extremely high uh, spectral and uh, temporal resolution. This is in terms of uh, time and frequency. Um, therefore, uh, if you, with the capability to image the entire primary beam of a VLBI array, that to increase the field of view, therefore we increase the sample size and we're able to see multiple suns targets in a single observation. So for example, we have this field here, this is the Gusnot field. Uh, that was up, observed with the EVN. And to highlight that this field has previously been uh, observed uh, using the VLBA, using the EVN. However, um, Radcliffe et al. applied this wide field uh, technique and was able to triple the number of observations from the 12 that were detected in the previous survey all the way to 31. So clearly seeing that um, uh, wide uh, field VLBI technique will greatly have will have great impact in our observations. So the wide field VLBI technique has been made possible by few uh, developments in few techniques, such as the multiple phase center correlation and the multiple source cal calibration technique, which I discuss in the next two slides. So when you talk about we talk of the multiple phase center correlation, uh, the VLBI. Uh, sky is sparse and uh, so correlating on the, the entire primary beam does not make sense and most of the time this results into just noise like 99% and results into huge data sets. 
So instead of uh, correlating uh, data on the whole uh, and the entire primary beam, what we do is that we uh, correlate simultaneously on multiple positions across the primary beam. What do we mean with that? So for example, here we have a theoretical wide field EVN survey of the M82 system. So the ye yellow circle shows the uh, EVN primary beam. So clearly you can see um, comparing to where we have the M82 system that uh, correlating, we don't really need to correlate the whole primary beam because we don't need like two thirds of uh, whatever data we get from this observation, we don't really need it. We only need say like a third uh, focusing on this region. So what we do is that we place um, face centers. These are uh, the blue, uh, the, the markers, the blue markers show the face centers. We place uh, these uh, face centers uh, on the plane of uh, the M82 system. This is the region where we're interested in. And the blue circle just shows where we've constrained uh, smearing uh, terms of bandwidth and time by less than 10% of the uh, uh, beam, beam size. So when we come to correlating, we only correlate what we need. And this is uh, correlate these faces as based on this uh, it, um, plane of this uh, system. So the face centers are either pre-selected to cover the entire region. So you can cover the whole area or just cover the region of interest, um, or it can be placed on sources of interest, like in this case, or uh, these face centers can be placed on uh, non-radio source positions. So for example, if this system had uh, previously been observed, say using the VLA, that is a very large array. So you know that uh, when you're carrying out this VLB observation, you know that at that particular uh, position, there's a source, so you place your face center at that uh, position. So this usually results in uh, small data sets in terms of field, field of view and uh, data size. However, we apply the same calibration steps. So this process is easily parallelizable. Uh, therefore, a large number of face centers can be correlated with a high time in frequency resolution in a single correlation, correlation pass. Thereby we're able to target uh, hundreds of objects in a single run. So the other technique that has made the application of the wide field VLBI technique possible is the multi-source cell calibration. So VLBI observations are affected by ionosphere and atmospheric turbulences. And considering that we're also um, observing very faint uh, sources at these very high redshifts, so uh, we have a source here. These are the these are two images of the same source. So on the right panel here, uh, we have this source uh, at a very high signal uh, to noise ratio, and uh, this is after we apply this multi-source self calibration. And what we mean is that um, uh, usually or before would uh, uh, um, we carry out something called standard self-calibration. This is whereby uh, this source is divided by uh, a model, a clean model that is derived from the source itself. But in the second case where we talk about multiple source, so we have uh, combined a number of sources that have been observed in this uh, uh, run in the, that are observed in the primary beam maybe 10 sources, we combine the 10 sources to create a clean model and then you divide the, the target with the clean model that has been derived from combining these uh, 10 or more sources. And uh, so the, the clean model developed is uh, uh, sufficient to uh, resolve, uh, to cover or to characterize the structure of this, um, the, source, the structure of this source are fully thereby revealing a point source structure with a very high sensitivity, uh, sorry, with a very high signal to noise ratio. Whereas when we just uh, divide this um, target by a clean model that is derived using the source itself, we, the, the model is not sufficient to fully characterize the structure of this radio source, thereby uh, revealing a source with a very uh, considerable uh, low signal to noise ratio. So these are some of the characteristics based on the observation with the VLBA and observations with the EVN. And to just draw attention to this panel on the right here, 
I shows the multi-wavelength coverage of this uh, Guzman field. So we have coverage with the X-ray optical using the Hubble Space Telescope. We have coverage with the uh, far infrared, mid in infrared, and radio using the using the VLA Imaline EVN. So the black circle here shows the observation with the VLA Imaline and the EVN, and. Uh, the blue region here shows the uh, coverage of this region with the Hubble Space Telescope that is in optical. And this is the same region that is covered with the VLB observations. Uh, so with the EVN, we detected that to one sources at a sigma of six. And then with the VLBA, we detected uh, 24 sources at a sigma of 5.5. So some of uh, interesting sources from our research. Uh, we have this uh, source at uh, uh, flux density of 22 millijanski. And just to note that this is one of the strongest sources in uh, this field, or rather in our survey. So this is the image of this source uh, using the VLA. So look, just looking at this source, you can infer that uh, this source is a jet, uh, sorry, is an AGN due to the presence of this jet. However, just looking at this source, we'll not be able to infer any uh, AGN activity because uh, the AGN is unresolved. Therefore, we bring in observations with the VLBI, resolve of the, uh, the noise, the, the low flux uh, regions. We just focus on the central uh, region of this source and you're able to um, resolve and reveal a compact core. So just looking at this uh, image, VLA image, you will not be able to infer or see the structure of the AGN, but applying observation of the VLBI, you're able to resolve of the AGN. Similarly, we have this uh, source at a uh, flux density of 0 0.6, very faint source. So this is the image with the VLA. And again, so this source does not have jets. So just looking at the VLA image, you will not be able to infer whether there's any AGN activity. Matter of fact, we just dismiss uh, there's no, there's nothing there, there's just noise or just that formation. However, we bring in observations with the uh, VLBA observations with the EVN and VLBA resolve the central region of this image and you're able, this source and you're able to reveal a compact uh, core structure in both the EVN and VLBA, thereby revealing that there's a AGN, there's an AGN in this very uh, faint uh, radio source. Thereby, you can see the application of uh, the VLBI in observations in this, uh, in observing these very faint uh, radio objects. So this is one of our interesting source in this survey. So these are the contour maps, uh, the VLA overlying the uh, optical image. And again, this is the contour radio, contour radio maps of the image in Imaline overlying the optical image. And uh, this is the observation with the VLBA, VLBA. So the red cross indicates the VLBI position. So what is interesting looking at this source, especially looking at the uh, image, the second image here with the Imaline, we see that the uh, radio peak position does not correspond to the uh, VLBI peak position because normally you'd expect the radio peak, uh, the, the peak of the radio emission on these images to coincide with the uh, VLBI position, but this is not the case in this image, uh, thereby indicating that this is a merging galaxy system where we have both star formation and AGN activity co-evolving. And to just highlight is that when you look at these uh, two images here, the VLA and the Imaline only, you will not be able to infer any AGN activity, but then you bring in a VLB observation and you're able to reveal like a compact core. And also considering the characteristics of this, uh, this uh, radio structure here, where it has a very high brightness temperature and very high luminosity level, indicating that indeed that, that's an AGN, there's, a, there's an AGN in this system. Thereby, we clearly see the importance of uh, VLB observation in observing satellite systems, whereby using um, basic VLA or Imaline observation definitely miss out the AGN. And therefore, 
you just likely you just likely tend to uh, classify this uh, radio structure as a star formation. So conclusion. So we've seen that uh, we need both the intermediate uh, radio interferometric angular resolution and the VL by VLBI angular resolution, which are important in this uh, deep field survey. And again, focusing on this survey, we've used imaging from VLA, EMALI, and VLBI, which is an SKA2 like data set. What do we mean? So looking at this uh, figure here, it shows, of course, shows the angular resolution for various uh, uh, radio instruments that are either operational, early science or under development. And again, showing the special resolution uh, capability of this instrument at a redshift of one. So for this study, we have used data from the VLBA, EVN, EMALIN, and VLA. And we can clearly see that uh, this data covers a space parameter that should only be covered using SKA. So these data sets in this study of ours can be used for key technical verification relevant for SKA pathfinders and technological developments for uh, this instrument to be used in SKA. And then again, many SKA fields will not be able to identify all extragalactic AGN, uh, especially due to lack of uh, radio excess measurement. When I talk about radio excess measurement, this is the flux ratio of uh, radio to uh, infrared in, given by the far infrared radio correlation formula. And this is due to insufficient resolution and again, uh, lack of uh, far infrared uh, telescope, like I've stated. And uh, instruments such as ALMA has a, a small field of view. Uh, therefore, VLB will uh, play a very important role in identifying AGN in this distant field, especially if no radio access measurements are available. So yeah, that's all from me. That's my research work. Uh, your questions are most welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and thank <laughs> you very much uh, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. It's uh, really nice to see not only the research that you are doing in Astro, but also the outreach activities uh, that you have with uh, in Kenya with the Kenyan girls. Uh, that's really fantastic. Um, and uh, so um, I really like to uh, wish you all the very best. Uh, and I hope to see a more success, uh, you know, uh, uh, from you in the years to come. Thank you. Um, so uh, people have questions or comments. Uh, don't be shy. Just, just, just. So, uh, if you have a question, either on the chat or uh, you just want to speak, um, you know, um, all the all questions are accepted here. So, and would you? So, you mentioned some of the some of the uh, telescopes that uh, in Africa, uh, mostly we see them in the north and. And this in, in the in the south, and there are maybe a few in the east, including Kenya and and and, and Mauritius. And you mentioned that the one that are on the north are optical, and the southern one are radio. Is there is there is there any reason for that? Is there any advantage between optical and radio in specific locations? Um, sorry, let me just get there. So uh, there's no particular reason or good reason why we, we have the optical astronomy, a majority of optical astronomy uh, activities in the, in the northern uh, part of Africa. Uh, and just to highlight that radio astronomy is still sort of a relatively new uh, science. So, and optical has been there for so long, I think, since Galileo, like way back in 1500. So I think that's the reason why we have uh, more development in terms of optical uh, astronomy as compared to radio astronomy. So uh, 
so far in Africa, we only have this, uh, we only had this um, radio observatory in South Africa for so long, just uh, I think two uh, telescope, I think since from uh, mid uh, 70s. And uh, yeah, we also have um, many other um, optical observatories in South Africa, including SALT, uh, which is a very large uh, uh, telescope. Yeah, so it's just, I think it's just because the radio astronomy is still relatively new, that's why it's not that well developed. But mm. we're hoping with the SKA, we hope that uh, SKA will spur development in uh, radio astronomy across the African continent. Okay. Um, yeah. Other people have questions, comments? Yes. Uh, good, good day, Anne, and, and thanks very much for a very, very, very informed uh, presentation. Um, I, I would like to, to ask you about just one thing on your background slide. Um, you showed a it looked like the evolution of uh, black holes and it had a discontinuity at a particular point. And I was wondering if you could explain why that particular curve just drops off at a point. I'm sorry, can you kindly tell me which, which uh, slide is it? You're getting, you're getting there. Okay. It had the background right there, 27. Okay, so what is your question? Sorry. Uh, light 27. 27. Okay. Yes. So what's your so, question? Yes, that one. Uh, you show the black hole growth. Yeah. Um, as a function of G of uh, time, I guess. Yeah. And at some point, uh, the black hole uh, distribution stops at a point just above four. Okay. And then, and then just uh, changes. And usually when you look at distributions, they tend to have somewhat of a curvature to it, but maybe that's just the resolution of this particular uh, distribution. Yeah, Can yeah, you, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I'm just, I just wondered how that, that curve is generated. Sorry, I'm not the one who generated this curve, but I'll, I think the problem here is to do with the resolution, angular resolution of like a, at up to what point are we able to fully resolve this region? So I think it's more to do with the angular resolution of the instruments rather than the distribution of. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. That that makes sense. Yeah, I, I was, I, I got the impression that there aren't enough black holes to be able to look around and see. So you did have enough data, but yeah, that, because, that's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, because Thanks. to be to be honest, we're able to sort of uh, fully fully uh, study these objects up to a ratio of about two. About so two, anything, okay. Yeah, yes. so anything beyond two, we don't have the uh, scientific capabilities yet. Okay, yeah. fine. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Very, very nice presentation. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? So, and earlier on at the beginning, I think you showed the, is, I think, uh, VLBI centers and so forth as in the, in the US and a bunch of them in Europe, but I didn't see very much of anything in Latin America. Is there, is there a reason for that? So I think- um, I Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So South America, I think we're the same vote with the African continent. Mm -hmm. However, we have this uh, ALMA, this is the uh, ALMA, this is the larger millimeter array, the Atacama millimeter, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, which is also one of the um, uh, currently most powerful uh, radio uh, arrays in the world right now, is still relatively new, but it's an array, it's not a VLBI, though I think sometimes it could be used for VLBI observations. So mm -hmm. yeah, so I think um, South America and Africa are just sailing in the same boat. Okay. So I think it's more economic, economic uh, reasons than anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, very good. So would you tell us a little bit about the progress on the on the SKA and uh, you know um, I think they have the meerkat right now in South Africa as a, a subset of it. So how how is that progressing in, in, you know to become you know a very uh, powerful research uh, 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 you know, network, especially for Africa. 
Yes, so we have uh, the uh, Meerkat uh, telescope is currently um, operational. And like I highlighted in one of my slides, sorry. We have this uh, survey called the Mighty, sorry, I don't have the whole meaning of the acronym, but it's the Mighty Survey with the Meerkat. And uh, uh, in the last few years, I think two, three years, they've really made some uh, tremendous discoveries. If anyone is inter interested, just Google Meerkat. But yeah, so it's already operational um, um, and we hope, yeah, I think all the 64 telescopes are already operational. And we hope uh, SKA to, uh, the construction of SKA will begin sometime, I think, in the next few years and hopefully become fully operational by 2030. So, yeah, um, Miyakat is fully operational at the moment and we're making like these great discoveries, especially with this mighty survey. Okay. Yeah. Oh, very good. Um, other questions or uh, other comments? I see that we have some people here who are also uh, experts or they are either doing PhDs or have finished the PhDs or in astrophysics. <clears throat> so if you have uh, other comments and I, you know, I see some also some guests from Namibia here, I see uh, Isaac here. Um, also, uh, uh, he dropped out uh, Tilahun. Anybody wants to uh, either tell us uh, anything else uh, related to the field uh, as described by Anne? All right, so in that case, Anne, um, so what is um, so what is left for you to to get to the PhD now? <laughs> oh yes, I am in my final year, so I still need uh, uh, this. Um, this work will form sort of like my first paper. It's almost uh, complete, uh, waiting submission. So I still have two more topics that I need to work on and uh, at least submit papers in the next one year. So <laughs> yeah, I'm almost there. So just trying to finalize things. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. very good. Yeah. Could you go back to that, uh, the outreach work that you are doing with uh, the Kenyan uh, uh, girls? It's really fantastic. And uh, I am very pleased to, you, you have mentioned it to me before and I'm very, very pleased to, uh, to hear about it and uh, 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 to hear that uh, you are also doing that. Um, okay, yeah. So, so how how do you organize this? You go to Kenya every year for for these events, and how how does it go? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I started this project in twenty nineteen, and then I shared this idea with a few ladies uh, that I know from this particular region. So I sort of recruited them. So we formed this team. We are about twenty mentors. And uh, in 2019, before uh, the pandemic, I traveled home and we carried out these activities. So I remember we went to uh, 10 schools and engaged girls in the final year of uh, the primary education. And then we uh, paired each girl with the mentor and then followed up on them sometime early last year and then early this year. So before the pandemic, that was a plan that I'll travel home. So I traveled in 2019. Last year, we did not do any anything. But early this year, when the school resumed, uh, some of our members on the ground were able to go to, I think, 10 schools and uh, yeah, carry out these outreach activities and the mentorship. Uh, yeah, activities. So, 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 so then you, you talk to the, to, to, to the, to the students, um, you know, you talk about your personal journey or uh, how do you do the motivation for all of this? Uh, you know, it's really wonderful to see this. Yes, yeah, so uh, basically myself and all the girls, uh, in, especially in this case, in this region, I look for uh, the ladies who have gone through the system, have gone through the same, um, maybe gone through the same schools, and they have some sort of uh, college education or at least, um, at least college and uh, uh, university education 
So we go back to these schools and just share our journey with these girls and just bottom line showing them that, hey, we've been through this system, we face the same challenges, we did it, so can you? Because uh, some of the main issues affecting these girls are things like early marriages and uh, uh, teenage youth pregnancies. They're very prevalent, like a large percentage of girls, they tend to drop out of school because of these two issues. And again, uh, these issues are further compounded by poverty and uh, you no know, lack of school fees. So yeah, we're just trying to show them that we've been through this system, we face the same challenges and yet we're here. And then we hope by monitoring and uh, tracking their progress for the next four years when they go through high school, we we'll, uh, still keep them motivated and that they will actually get to complete secondary education. And also the objective is that if um, we encounter any girls that you know, face any of these challenges, whether they uh, you know, get children, we are able to facilitate for them to go back to school after they deliver the baby as seen with the Sharon case. So in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. And that aside, uh, we've also started with the funding from the OAD. We've also started something I'm calling the Astro STEM workshops. This by we providing uh, uh, STEM oriented workshops for girls in the first year and the second year of uh, secondary education, just to motivate them to engage them in the physics uh, subject and to encourage them, you know, to enjoy the subject. And hopefully, uh, they will get to select the subject when it comes to the national. Uh, uh, select this, uh, the physics subject towards the end of secondary education and sit for the uh, physics national examination at the end of the four years in high school. Because we've seen a case whereby, for example, one of the schools that we're engaging. So in Kenya, sorry, if I just give you a background, in Kenya, uh, we normally tend to select uh, subjects in the third year of uh, uh, secondary education. So the first year and second year, we just taught all the subjects. Then in the third year, you select what you want to do and what you want to uh, sit for in the national examination. So most of the time, uh, most students tend not to select physics. And I think it's sort of like a global uh, problem. So with this uh, Astro STEM workshops and mentorship, we want to encourage more girls to select uh, physics towards the end of secondary education and to actually sit for the physics national examination. And like I was saying, we have a school that they've already selected subjects and out of, I think, 60 students, no one has selected the physics subject. So we hope with this Astro STEM, uh, we'll have the first Astro STEM uh, next month when they resume school. So we hope <laughs> that this is, we're just trying to save the, salvage the situation. And once we hope that once we deliver these uh, Astro STEM in this school, and in this case, we'll be targeting all the girls and the boys we hope that at least we'll have a few students uh, coming back and selecting physics because this will mean come the national examination maybe in a year or two years time and no one in this school will be sitting for the physics national examination which is really sad so yeah that's what we're trying to do sorry <laughs> very good very good it's very commendable that you're carrying this uh, forward uh, while you are also completing your phd um and that's, that's very impressive yeah I'm sorry, I could tell you. Can can you can Anne? Can you say how many people go with you to this effort? So yeah, at the beginning we had uh, twenty men, about twenty mentors. We had twenty ladies joining us for these activities, and then we visited uh, ten schools. So we, in, uh, in our first visit, uh, we were targeting the girls in the final year of education, but we also included uh, the girls from the following two classes. So uh, I think uh, we uh, reached out to more than a thousand girls in this uh, first drive, but uh, because you're focusing on the students, on the girls in the final year of their primary education, so we reached out to 300 girls uh, in 2019, that's like our first class. So at the moment we have about 300 girls that we are following up, and then we have the girls sitting for the final examination this year, they'll still join the uh, the program and you continue with the monitoring and tracking. Thanks very much. Very good, Anne. Um, other question, uh, Stefan, you have your hands raised, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is Steven Nyaranga. I'm from Kenya. 
and uh, I've done education science, physics, mathematics. I've majored in physics from Karatina University. Okay. I'm very glad to hear from our speaker of today, Anne. Congratulations for the good work you have done here in Kenya and also the, the progress that we are moving on with. Thank Mine you. is just to congratulate you. And, uh, and as far as what I've seen, uh, your good work you're doing here in Kenya, I think you can uh, incorporate me in the program so that uh, I can assist also in mentoring the, 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 the young ones so that uh, they can aspire to do as more work in, in physics area. Sure, because, sure. Uh, because I'm here and I've seen also the, the challenge is real. Girls are not really, really taking part in doing physics and also aspiring to move forward because of uh, the background that they are in and the challenges that they are facing. But in regards to what you are doing, I think we can, we can change the society and even the entire world in terms of how physics is uh, looked upon. So congratulations for the good work. Otherwise, I'm ASP 2020, okay. and uh, Ketevi is my mentor now. We are moving on with, <laughs> with our program. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Welcome, and just drop me an email. Thank you. Uh, Santi, Ash, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Anne, so could you go to your work uh, with the other ASP student uh, on the COVID-19 study? Yeah, so... Um, um, yeah, I, you didn't mention that this paper is going to be submitted very soon for publication. I'm just working on, on Toivo for, to finish up a few comments um, about Zambia. But could you say something about what is the COVID-19 situation in Kenya now and, and what is happening? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, from the reports back at home, so things were a bit quiet uh, from around December all the way to, I think, uh, uh, February, but uh, we now have sort of um, a surge in cases. I really don't know what's going on. Probably Stephen can update us on this situation, but um, yeah, we have an increased uh, um, uh, infection rate at the moment. So then the country has gone back into some sort of uh, partial lockdown where we have uh, uh, several um, uh, counties that are under lockdown at the moment. Have they received any, vac any vaccine yet? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah, we, I think we have AstraZeneca. I think it's been rolled out, and even my own family. I think they've gone for vaccination. So yeah. Okay. Mm. But Very the good. cases are going up at the moment. I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think we relaxed. <laughs> mm. Yeah. All right. Anybody with uh, any further questions or comments? Um, is it if possible not, for us to, I'm sorry, ahead. is it possible for us to get a copy of this uh, COVID? Uh, is there a preprint for this COVID? Uh, um, it, yeah, no, I, we, I will send it to you. We, don't, we haven't yeah. preprinted yet. There's one country, Zambia, that we are finishing up the study. So within the next few days. OK, thanks. We'll have it, yeah. All right, so I suggest that we take uh, the screenshot. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, gallery view. Yeah, all right. So, um, last time I wasn't successful in, successful in, in doing it. Okay, now it's fine. So, um, yeah, anybody who wants to turn on the video and they want to be seen and so forth, uh, so just be ready and uh, I will take the screenshot, okay? So, all right, so I think that is done. And thanks again for, wait, 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 no, I want to turn on my video. Um, so I'm gonna repeat it. All right. So um, thanks again, Anne, for all of the, the work that you are doing and it's very commendable. I'm really, really happy to see uh, many ASP alumni who are doing very, very well. And that's the purpose of this series for us to tell us uh, all the good things that you are doing. And also 
let's connect with Monia on social media so that we can make that uh, dynamic and so forth, yeah? yeah. And uh, we are now developing African strategy for fundamental physics. So your outreach activities in Kenya are gonna be very important. I have not bugged you there yet because I know you are working to finish your PhD, but I will come to you uh, so that we can discuss, you know, how you should be involved, yeah? In fact, Munia, Munia can talk to you because it's also the Young Physicists Forum aspect. Okay. Uh, okay. But, uh, it would be nice for you to get involved with that as well. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, so if there's no other questions or comments, I would suggest that we stop uh, now. Uh, next week, we'll hear from Ahmed Ayad, and uh, he will talk to us about, about action and very interesting physics as well. So. Uh, it'll be fantastic. Ahmed, how are you doing? Yeah, okay, well, Prof, thank you. Very good. Uh, so, so we hear from you next week. Yeah, sure. Very good. All right. Thanks, everybody, and uh, uh, have a good day and have a good week. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Nice time. Bye. Thank you.